And please remain standing as you are able for our reading from Scripture from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated and let us pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful for today. We are grateful for the very air that fills our lungs. And we are grateful that you have gathered us together today to celebrate you to be in community with one another, and to uh, listen and consider your word. So Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit uh, on us. Let it work within us that we might hear a message from you today uh, and leave this place different than the way we walked in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, welcome to University United Methodist Church. Uh, my name is Will Rice. I actually work for the Rio Texas Annual Conference, but I used to work here, and I've been invited to come back for a few weeks uh, to help during the time of transition as you prepare for uh, Pastor Ben Trammell to come to be uh, one of your new uh, pastors here. And I've got to tell you, so far, this has been a whole lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, we started uh, my first sermon. We talked about anger, right? Uh, and then our inability to pray, that was a fun one. Uh, and then last week, about when God says no to us when we pray. I mean, it's just a riot, right? All right. So today I'm just going to talk about salt. Delicious, delicious, French fry enhancing, pretzel clinging, shortening my lifespan salt. But first, uh, happy Mother's Day to all the uh, mothers and mothering types uh, out there. Uh, a day that mothers are usually, uh, if they play it right, given a free ticket to do whatever they want. And millions of mothers take that opportunity to come to church and bring their families with them, which leads to uh, great attendance uh, in churches that is oddly much higher than on Father's Day. When fathers also tend to get a free ticket to do whatever they want, but that's for another sermon. Now, Mother's Day has also been a very complicated day for me and for uh, many others. Now, don't get me wrong, it is good to take a day in our world to celebrate the women who give us life, who raise us and equip us to have a full and abundant existence. However, it's also a day when if we think of ourselves as the body of Christ, that we need to also be sensitive uh, to those for whom this day is not a day of celebration, and that is a lot of people. Uh, we need to remember those for whom uh, the loss of a mother is still very, very raw. We need to remember those for whom uh, maybe a, a mother figure was not a strong presence in their lives. We need to remember those mothers for whom the loss of a child is still very, very fresh. And even if it's not, it does a lifelong pain. Uh, we need to remember those women who desperately want to have children, uh, but who cannot. We need to remember those who do the very real work of mothering, but don't fall into society's picture of what a mother is. And we need to remember those mothers who give their very soul to raise a child only to hand that child off to another person. 
And we need to remember mothers who are separated from their children due to estrangement or, or custody fights or their own battles with addiction or mental illness or other diseases that keep them from being with their children. Because when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. But I do believe, as a church, we should take a day to celebrate motherhood. But I think that as we do it, it is good to do it in the context of the gospel. It is good to do it in that sentimental, heartwarming way, but also through the wider lens of the gospel. So let's look a little bit closer at the scripture that we read today that is about salt. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? Now, one of the hardest parts about Bible study is actually putting aside what we think something means in order to understand what it actually means. It's not necessarily our fault, but we come to Scripture with a whole bunch of predefined notions about what it means. And that is true even for someone like me who didn't grow up reading Scripture or listening to sermons, I still, because I live in the culture, have that sort of, uh, that context, those notions of what things mean. And over the years, as people have interpreted the Bible, their interpretations have become part of the collective consciousness of Christians and non-Christians alike. And now, sometimes those, those interpretations sort of get into uh, the language of uh, the culture. For instance, you don't need to be a a Christian or go to church to to understand what someone means when they say uh, she was a good Samaritan, right? Um, I never read the Bible, but I knew what a doubting Thomas was. And, And you don't need to do Bible study most of the time to understand what salt of the earth means. And you can look it up in a dictionary, and I did that just to make sure that it would say what I thought it might say. It's listed as an idiom, right? Now, I've been out of college for a couple of years, so I had to look up idiom first. Uh, Now, remember, an idiom is a form of uh, speech uh, that is peculiar to itself grammatically or cannot be understood from the individual meaning of its words, as in keep tabs on You wouldn't know what that meant unless you understood the the underlying meaning of the idiom. And salt of the earth is an idiom, right? You can't just figure out salt and earth. What does that mean? And, And the dictionary definition of it is a person or group considered as the best or noblest part of society. Huh. So if I were to to take this passage with simply what I read in the passage in my dictionary uh, definition, uh, this could be a short sermon. And you're like, okay, yes, let's, let's, let's do that. It's going to be really crowded at Luby's after church this morning. I could say, you are the salt of the earth. Congratulations. You have arrived. And, and I kind of like the sound of that. They were very clear when I went to seminary. Uh, they said, you know, every once in a while you need to preach a feel-good sermon, otherwise people will stop liking you, right? And since it's Mother's Day, I think I got this. Okay, forget about everybody else. I could say, mothers are the salt of the earth. Grand applause, hymn, second offering, benediction. Where everybody gets to lunch early. You're going to be really disappointed when I keep talking, but I am. I'm not so sure about that, that idiom of salt of the earth. Uh, what is salt in the first place? Maybe we need to understand that to see what Jesus was talking about. Sodium chloride is what um, it is. And I don't know that we think of salt in the same way that Jesus thought of salt. When I hear salt, my brain goes immediately to western New York where I grew up. It was the stuff that we we put on the roads to melt the ice in the winter, and it's the stuff that clings to your car, and in the case of my 1976 Datsun B210 made parts fall off, right? It would just rust away. That salt would get on there, caused oxidation, leading to iron oxide, and it was very normal where I grew up to have a car that when you drove, you could see the road beneath you, right? Those floorboards would rust right out. It was kind of like we had convertibles, but they were upside down. 
When I think of salt, I also think of my doctor in my head um, telling me to stop eating so much of it because it's bad for my blood pressure. However, it doesn't matter because when she mentions salt, I start thinking about salt, right? <laughs> mounds and mounds of french fries covered in salt. Okay. When Jesus is talking about salt, I think we can assume he's not talking about the rusty car kind, right? He's thinking about it in a positive way. And in the place and time where Jesus lived, salt was nearly as precious as gold, though far more abundant. The Dead Sea is full of salt, right? And so there were great salt mines on the side of the sea. You could scrape it off the rocks around the sea. Or honestly, you could just take some water out of there and let the water evaporate, and then you would have salt. But salt, even though it was abundant, salt was precious because it was life-sustaining. A little bit of history. During Jesus' time, uh, people didn't have refrigerators, Salt, because it was readily available, was an essential food preservative, right? See, we don't think about this much anymore, although a lot of our stuff is preserved with salt. But we used to be able to just take meat, well, you still can, but people don't as much, and soak it in a, in a salt solution and then dry it, and it could last for, for months without refrigeration, without spoiling. See, the salt pulls the moisture out of uh, the meat and kills the bacteria that would normally make it go bad. Now, we still eat that, but more of a delicacy now than a necessity. But in Jesus' time, without that salt, the food would go bad and people would go hungry. So when Jesus is talking about salt, Jesus is talking about the salt that sustains life. You could imagine that a, a substance this important would begin to almost take on a, a mystical quality, a religious significance, a, a magical substance that could stop food from decaying and could help preserve life-giving food. Now, of course, it also didn't take people long to figure out that it made stuff taste good. See, now we have so many cooking methods and sauces and sweeteners and spices, we sometimes forget how miraculous salt can be. And it's not the flavor of salt, right? It's what it does to other things. And that's not a new invention. Jesus knew about that too. And imagine living in a time where cooking was, was pretty basic, uh, done on a, on a stone fire uh, heated oven or simply a, an open flame with no barbecue sauce to speak of. Salt was just plain miraculous. And we read about it in uh, Scripture, Job chapter 6, verse 6, a very, very old book in the Bible, Can That Which Is Tasteless Be Eaten Without Salt? Its seasoning uh, properties are referred to in, in Exodus uh, chapter 30. Salt was used to season the offerings of incense used in worship. According to Leviticus 2, anything that was offered to God needed to be seasoned with salt. You shall not admit from your grain offerings the salt of the covenant with your God. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. So when Jesus is talking about salt, he's also talking about the salt that seasons life. Which is all a long way of saying, when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying quite a bit. I think a deeper understanding of what salt could do and what salt meant to Jesus' original audience, that idiomatic understanding of salt of the earth as a person or group considered to be the best or noblest part of society is, is quite limited, if not incorrect. My contention is that this statement, you are the salt of the earth, is not a statement of status, but rather a statement of function. I think that it's immensely important. Let me say that again. I believe the statement, you are the salt of the earth, is less a sta statement of status and more a statement of function. 
See, if you are the salt of the earth was a statement of status, then I could say before, hey, congratulations, good job, let's all go to lunch, you've arrived, you are the salt of the earth. However, if it is a statement of function, I might say we better get to work. We have a lot of work to do because we are called to be the salt of the earth. And if we are called to be the salt of the earth, what does that mean? What are we supposed to do about it? When Jesus says salt, Jesus is talking about the salt that sustains life and the salt that seasons life. Salt sustains life. It preserves food. It keeps bacteria from spoiling it. Salt seasons. We know that part. It's what makes food taste better. How are we like salt? We sustain and we season. That's our function. See, as Christ representatives in the world, we sustain life, and we sustain life in two ways. First of all, and these are no particular order, we sustain life by sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me read you real quick from uh, the gospel according to John, uh, chapter 20, verse uh, 31. Let me start back in verse 30, John uh, chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing him, you may have life in his name. Now I want to remind you again, it is Mother's Day, right? And I mentioned earlier that Mother's Day is a big attendance day in the the life of the church universal. See, when husbands and kids say, what do you want to do today, Mom? Many mothers say, go to church. And often the kids and the dads say, okay, well, have fun. (laughs) And the mothers say, no, 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 no. I meant all of us. I got to tell you, from from being a pastor, I have learned this very, very clearly. A lot of mothers and grandmothers and mother figures want nothing more than the ones they love to know Jesus. For many, it is their heart's deepest desire. If they could have anything at all for their loved ones, it would be a relationship with the one who created them. Out of all the things, happiness, success, safety, love, the one that concerns moms the most is whether or not those they love will have a relationship with God. Now, churches that are truly living out the gospel mission do this in an even more universal way because they see every person as a child of God and they want them to be in a relationship with God that's what we're talking about when we use that really really uh, scary word in church Uh, not stewardship it's worse evangelism right we want to see our sanctuary full not because we like having to hunt for a parking spot not because we can tell people how full it is not because it helps our our budget and the growth of the church but because the deepest desire of our hearts is that everyone have a relationship with the one who created us is that right is that the deepest desire of our hearts i hope so Okay, second, we sustain life first by connecting people to Jesus and second by providing for the least and the last and the lost. We sustain life by making sure those in our community, our city, our world have enough to eat and drink and they have clothes and shelter and love and a chance at life. In uh, 1 John Chapter 3, verse uh, 17, we read, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. 
Now, again, it's Mother's Day. I get to witness every day my wife Alicia be a mother to our two boys. And you know what mothers do? They give everything they have to make sure that their kids are safe, warm, loved, clothed, and prepared. And between the two kids that, that we have now and the, the other three that, that we raised in the foster care, I, I am pretty sure my wife didn't sleep for about three years. Maybe a cat nap. You moms out there know this to be true. Mothers would lay down their lives for their kids. And when they aren't called to do that, they still actually hand over a large part of their lives, their health, their wealth, and certainly their sanity to their kids. In a more universal way, if we consider every person a child of God, as a church, I would think we would give a giant piece of ourselves to those who need it. When Jesus says salt, Jesus means the salt that seasons life and sustains life. So we talked about sustaining. Let's talk about seasoning. And I want to read you a quote. I love this quote. It's a really feel-good quote. Have you looked at these Christians closely? Hollow-eyed, pale-cheeked, they brew their lives away, unspurred by ambition. The sun shines for them, but they do not see it. The earth offers them its fullness, but they desire it. No, all their desire is to renounce and to suffer that they may come to die. Wow. That was written by a Roman emperor, Julian, who took the throne after Constantine had made Christianity, Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Author Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Well, thank goodness none of this is true anymore, right? You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now you here at university are a fairly lively bunch, but I have to tell you, uh, we need to think of the perception sometimes of the Christian church. And I can tell you from experience that young, unchurched uh, folks think that Christians are uh, boring, with a capital B. Now, that might be a perception problem. Maybe Christians aren't really boring and people just think that they are, but it's still a perception problem. And maybe it's not just a perception problem. It's really easy for the church, because it does it every so many generations, to slide into the role of just simply being the enforcers of morality and polite behavior. I've actually heard it said, and I had to think back, I may have said it myself uh, one time to one of my kids, uh, and when I said, quit laughing, you're in church. See, no, no, stop. No, just kidding. Please. But it gets to feel like that sometimes, right? That, that it is our job, our duty to be polite and, and to enforce morality. Now, maybe the church has a role to play in, in helping each other act the way Jesus would have us act. However, enforcing behavior is certainly not the primary function of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Jesus says salt, Jesus means the salt that seasons life. If we want to be the salt of the earth, we need to find again the lost radiance of the Christian faith. This should be exciting. Frankly, serving the one who created all the earth should be fun. It should be so exciting that people on the outside look in and go, what are those people doing? How do I get to be a part of that? Now, I grew up as a kid surrounded by two very, very different communities. My dad was a volunteer fireman, so I spent an inordinate amount of time around firemen. And they were a lively bunch. It was a normal part of my world uh, where I grew up that, that 
fire departments, volunteer fire departments, would have attached to the fire department what they'd call a social hall, right? Uh, it was pretty much a bar attached to the fire hall, which doesn't make you know, that much sense, but still. So I spent a lot of my childhood in that social hall, playing pool, watching TV, drinking Pepsi and eating potato chips, while the burly firemen uh, drank beer and smoked. Now, my dad's uh, mom and family belonged to the Baptist Church, which was oddly right next door to the fire department. I loved my grandmother. I did. But there were times when I had to hang out at the church instead of the fire hall. I didn't like that very much. My dad's side of the family practiced and still does practice a, a form of Christianity that is not very recognizable to me because its focus is on the sins of others. They sequester themselves from the outside world, casting judgment on non-believers and enjoying their own status as God's chosen people. And to a kid, there is nothing more boring than that. They weren't big fans of some of the things that went on over at the fire hall. But I loved those guys. And I meant guys. This was the 70s, right? There were no women firefighters back then. There are now. It's a very, very different place. And they smoked and they drank. And... But they would drop anything they were doing or wake up in the middle of the night to rush to save someone's house, someone's family, someone's livestock, someone's pets from fire or water or whatever. And when someone in the fire department family died, I would see every single one of those men show up at the funeral home to pay respects and then offer to do anything in the whole world to help that family that was grieving. Man. See, I became a Christian a lot later in life when I realized that Christianity actually was supposed to look a lot more like the fire department than it was the church next door. Now, I'm no longer a fan of all the smoking and the drinking, and honestly, either are the firemen anymore. As years went by, they realized, that's really bad for us. Perhaps we should put a gym in the fire department and get exercise. So I'm not a fan of everything they did, but I am a fan of the community that meets together, enjoys one another, builds each other up, would do anything in the world to help another human being, whether they know them or not. I grew up wanting to be a fireman. In my hometown, they didn't have to recruit volunteer firemen. There was a waiting list to be a part of that thing that paid nothing and required an awful lot of someone. Now, maybe as a church, if we were a little bit more like habanero peppers and less like salt-free, all-purpose food seasoning, we wouldn't need to worry so much about evangelism because people would be knocking on the doors trying to find out what was so exciting about this. That's how we become the light of the world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world, which is kind of funny because I thought Jesus was the light of the world, and actually he says that in John uh, chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world, and we as followers of Jesus, who are called to live in unity with him, are called to serve him, are also called to function as the light of the world, living in such a way as to draw others to him. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Is that what we do? I worry. It's hard anymore to have any perspective on what we look like to people who don't know Jesus. I've lived as an insider in the Christian faith just long enough that I don't know anymore. But I read and I watch how secular media covers the Christian church. I mostly see stories of what we're against and what we're protesting and who we're boycotting. Now, don't get me wrong, it is our duty to raise our voices when we see injustice and oppression and harm, 
But we also need to think about what is we are doing that sustains life, that seasons life, and that shines light into the world in such a way that others are drawn to Jesus. And maybe that brings us back to Mother's Day. In the context of the gospel, mothers can be a model of the Christian life. Not only do they give life, but they have the opportunity to sustain and season life and be the light of the world that shines on their own children and beyond. Which leads me to some Mother's Day week homework. You didn't see that coming, did you? This week, as we go about our lives, let's do something. Let's think about how we are living out our function as Christians. Let's look at our actions and our interactions, paying attention to our conversations, reviewing our Facebook posts and likes, if you do that sort of thing, and asking ourselves the question, how am I sustaining and seasoning life? And is my light shining into the world in a way that would lead people to know Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is our, our function, our sustaining and seasoning commission to bring life, to bring the good news of Christ to the world, both through our actions and by the invigorate, invigorating example those actions set. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. May to God be the glory. Amen.